worthy to be praised at all times. And we're grateful to the Almighty for his mercies upon our lives. The scripture teaches us that his mercies endure forever. And then it speaks to the house of Israel, who we are, and it says, Now let all the house of Israel say his mercies endure forever. It is such a um, wonderful privilege to be able to teach the word of Elohim. I bless him today for his great grace and his mercies. We bless the Almighty for each one of you who have assembled yourselves together here on Shabbat to worship our King and also to hear the word, the divine Elohim of the Most High. It is uh, my desire that in the teaching that uh, you would hear from the Most High and that he would speak to your heart and to your mind regarding his ways, regarding his purposes and the things that he has in store for your lives. But before we get into uh, the teaching, I do want to share a couple things uh, by way of announcements. Uh, on next week, uh, we will be celebrating Purim. We're going to have a uh, Purim celebration. And um, on next week, we probably have a little more than what we have today. Mm -hmm. There are some that we have invited to come and to be a part of uh, the celebration. And uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful uh, time. Uh, we find that while Purim is not one of the mandated Moedim, Torah yet, uh, in the scriptures, we find that it is significant to the plan and purpose of the Most High because it is one of those celebrations that marks how the Father preserved his people mm -hmm. to preserve the promise of Moshiach coming, uh, both with Purim and also with Hanukkah we see the hand of the Most High in preservation. See, the devil, Hasatan, the devil wanted to eliminate the tribe of Yahudah, the tribe of Judah. He wanted to eliminate that tribe because he knew the prophetic word that the Messiah would come through the line of Yahudah. He knew that. And because he knew that, he sought to try to eliminate, to exterminate the tribe of Yahudah. And so he uh, tried to do that, of course, uh, in the time of Esther, of Hadassah. You know, he tried to do that and uh, failed, of course, because the prophetic word and the prophetic promise of the Almighty has to be sustained. It has to come to pass. Mm -hmm. And so we, we celebrate it because we recognize the hand of the Most High in preserving his people. And so we're going to be having that celebration on uh, next uh, Shabbat. Uh, now, dear brother, you're welcome to come and be a part of it. Uh, and uh, my wife, she's going to be sharing on uh, that uh, particular service and uh, bringing forth the word <clears throat> and look forward to hearing what the Most High has to say through you. Uh, also, we are going to be getting ready for Pesach, Passover. Uh, we plan to celebrate Pesach on uh, the, uh, I believe it's March the 30th, I believe it is. It's on the, it's on the Shabbat. It's at the end of the Shabbat. Um, when, when the sun goes down on Shabbat, we'll be celebrating during the Seder. And so uh, we are yet to determine where we're going to uh, have <laughs> the Passover as far as the location. But I'm thinking we may uh, rent a hall somewhere where we can be able to celebrate together. And so uh, for those who may be interested in celebrating with us, uh, I'm not sure what your plans are, dear brother, but you're more than welcome to participate with us when we uh, celebrate uh, Pesach. 
and um, we always look forward uh, to this season because uh, it marks our Messiah being the Lamb slain from the foundations of the universe. And um, we always enjoy our time of Pesach. So we look forward to that coming as well. So let's be in prayer for that. Um, want to also uh, ask if you would keep in prayer uh, the scattered descendants of uh, House of Israel all over the world. You know, there, there are many people <clears throat> in our world that are unaware of the scattered descendants. Some think that uh, the uh, state of Israel uh, composes what, you know, we call the uh, scattered descendants of Israel. Uh, we know that the state of Israel uh, basically are descendants of converts to Yahud, Yahuda, the, the re religion of Yahudism. Uh, and some of them are mixed in with the scattered descendants. But the scattered descendants that are scattered all over the world, many of them don't even know who they are. You have many of them that are in the deepest regions of Africa and West Africa. Many of them are in India, in the Maharashtra areas of India. Many of them are down in Mexico and down in the Peruvian area and in Brazil. We have scattered descendants all over the place, even up in the most northern regions of Europe. But many don't know that they're actually blood descendants of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And so um, we want to pray for those uh, descendants of the bloodline that are coming into the knowledge of who they are. Even many of the Palestinians that live in Palestine are blood descendants, even though they practice Islam. Mm -hmm. They're blood descendants of the line. And the promise of the return goes out to all of the blood descendants, whether they are in Moshiach at this time or not. The promise is that the Most High is going to send out his witnesses by his Ruach to bring them to Messiah. And when Mashiach returns, he'll bring us all into the land of promise. That time we await. But I say these things because we live in a world that is very unaware of the scattered natural descendants of the house of Israel. <laughs> so I preach about this. I talk about it. I let people know about it. I, I let them know that uh, many who say that they are of the house of Israel because they practice the faith of Yehudism, uh, they have a small percentage of, 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 of Hebrew in them. I said, but you have scattered all over the world the lost uh, tribes of Israel, the ten tribes that were scattered, and they're still all over the place, yet to be recovered. And the Messiah will bring them back to himself through the preaching and the teaching. He's bringing them back to himself. And what a wonderful thing uh, our king is doing mm -hmm. and how he is restoring and bringing back the understanding of the house of Israel. But we know that it's not just composed of blood descendants. We know the house of Israel is composed of all believers in the Messiah. Mm -hmm. For the Apostle Paul, when he spoke about the uh, Goyim, he said that you are grafted in, he said, as a wild olive branch. But what did he say? He said, don't boast. He said, because... You don't bear the root, he said, but the root bears you. And so it's important <clears throat> that we understand that the Most High has a plan for keeping his way that is intended for the whole world. See, the whole world has been given Torah. <laughs> we teach here that Torah is for the world, mm -hmm. not just for the descendant Israelites. It's for the whole world. Because the Most High told our father, Abraham, he said, I'm going to make you 
a blessing and that through your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So it has been the intent of the father to raise up Abraham so that he could restore his purposes through him. Why? Because at that time when Abraham was alive, the world had turned to the Babylonian paganism. But Abraham obeyed the Most High, and because of his obedience, the Most High channeled his purposes through him because of his faith and his obedience. And so all who come to the Most High by faith and obedience are seen just like our daddy Abraham. And so we want to be encouraged to know that the Most High has not left out anybody. Isn't that a good thing to know? <laughs> he hasn't left anyone out. That's why Yahshua said, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so we bless the Almighty today for everything that he's doing and what he will continue to do in bringing about his purposes. Baruch Hashem, bless his name. Well, this time we want to <clears throat> we want to go to the book of Matthew, chapter twenty six. We're continuing systematically in the book of Matthew. We're in the twenty sixth chapter. Blessed be he who reigns forever. <clears throat> And we're going to begin at verse 47 and read through verse 56. Matthew chapter 26, beginning at the 47th verse. I'm going to read through verse 56. Beginning at the 47th verse. And while he yet spake, Judas, or Judah, that's what they called him then, <clears throat> one of the twelve came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, or clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Yeshua, and he said to Yeshua, Hail, Rabbi. In your Bibles it might say Master, but in the original Greek it actually says Rabbi. So it says, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Yeshua said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then came they and laid hands on Yeshua and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Yeshua stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Yeshua answered him, Put up again your sword into its place, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Do you think that I cannot now pray and my father, or to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be so? In that same hour, Yeshua said to the multitudes, Are you come out against me as a thief with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple. And you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures 
of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Avinu Makeno, we do bless you. We do thank you again for the opportunity to teach the scriptures on this Shabbat. And I asked that you would provide me with wisdom and with clarity to communicate the word with power and by your Ruach, your spirit. I pray, Most High, that you would touch the hearts and minds of each one assembled and that you would open the understanding of your people to receive the truth of Scripture. And those who may be uh, viewing us, we pray, Most High, that you would open their hearts and their minds, that they would also have an understanding of your purposes and that our Messiah had to go through this process of humbling himself and preparing for his own demise so that redemption might be accomplished. We thank you and pray most high that you be glorified in everything that is done. In the mighty name of Yahshua, we give thanks. Amen. Well, we bless the Almighty for the word. What we find in these passages of the scriptures is a situation where Messiah is about to be taken. Leading up to this particular event, Messiah had celebrated the Passover with his disciples. They had went out to the base of the Mount of Olives and they had sung a Hallel, a song, which is customary on Passover to do. And then afterwards, Messiah had taken three of his disciples with him. Peter, or Kepha, James, which is named Yaakov, and Yohanan, John, Peter, James, and John. He took them with him to the place called Gethsemane, or the proper Hebrew term would be Gethsemanim. Now, Last week, Shabbat, we talked about and dealt with Messiah at Gethsemane. It's more properly known, or I guess more properly known as the Garden of Gethsemane. And we dealt with how Messiah at this particular time was going through a very pressing uh, moment. You know, when we read from the Greek scriptures about all that Messiah was feeling and going through, the Greek term gives us the idea that he became very depressed and sorrowful because he was about to undergo torture and crucifixion. So last week when we were dealing with that, we were showing the process of how Messiah was now going through a situation where the anointing upon him, because he, we call him Mashiach, because he is the anointed king. We know that the smearing of the oil, the anointing of the spirit, all of that is for the purposes of giving authority and kingship to our Messiah. It's given to him so that he can exercise power and demonstration of the mighty acts of Elohim in the earth. But at this particular time frame, Passover, or I'll say the celebration of the Passover, their Seder meal had ended. Messiah begins to shift. He goes through a process of having that, I call, anointing pressed out of him. And you say, well, why? As we talked about it last week, and I have to bring this information up in order for us to really deal with uh, these passages that we're dealing with today. 
he had to have the anointing pressed out of him because he was about to endure death and crucifixion and he was about to become a curse. Everybody understand that? Scripture says, he that's hanged upon a tree is a curse. And so we find that the Messiah is about to go through this process. And when he came to get Shimonim or Gethsemane, as they translated it, the name Get Shimonim means the pressing of the olives. So they were at the base of the Mount of Olives. All the Mount of Olives is is just a mountain that's full of olive trees. It's a great big olive orchard. That's what it is. And people would come there to press the oil. All right? So the place where Messiah was, where he was with his disciples, and where he went to go pray, and he asked them, can you wait and watch with me for an hour in prayer? And they were tired. You know, they were sleepy. You know, for those of us who celebrated Pesach and after you have the Passover Seder, you know, that normally lasts about a couple hours or so. And uh, after a while, you know, you get you get kind of tired. I know after we're all said and done after having Passover, we're kind of tired, you know what I mean? And think about it. When Messiah was with his disciples, it no doubt probably was well into the late hours, probably around what we call midnight, maybe what we call one o'clock. Uh, in the morning, it was it was late, and they were tired. They were sleepy, and so Messiah. Sorry, I'm sorry, Pastor. Do you mind if I if I can record that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so, what we what we want to be mindful of here in this particular instance with Messiah is that. He's going through a process. All of the anointing, that authority, that power was being, I would say, pressed out of him. And maybe I should say it's symbolically being pressed out of him. Not that he can lose anything, but he was going through a process. And it is so important that we understand that he was going through a process. Because look at this, and I've, and I've said this before. Here it is, he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane, the place of pressing the olives. All right? He was being pressed. And he went to the Father three times and he said, if this cup can pass from me, Please let it pass. The reality of it is that Messiah did not want to go through the process of suffering. I don't care what any Bible scholar, Bible teacher, theologian has to say. Sometimes, you know, we, we as Bible teachers and those of us who have been trained theologically in the Western Christian schools of thought, we like to try and say, well, you know, Messiah didn't want to uh, go through being separated from the Father. You know, there's some who feel like he, he knew he was about to go through this process of suffering, but, you know, he could handle the suffering, but, you know, he didn't want to be separated from the Father because he was going to take upon himself all the sins of the world. Yes, we, we know that he was definitely going to take upon himself all the sins of the world. Isaiah 53 tells us that he was going to bear the sins of us all. It, it told us that. We know that. But when Messiah was there praying in the garden, he did not want to go through the suffering and eventual death. Now, I'm not going to minimize the fact that Messiah had went through all of the range of emotions that human beings go through when they know that they are about to face something that's going to, <laughs> in this particular instance, take him out. 
When you know that your destiny is to be the lamb slain from the foundations of the universe, that your whole reason for coming into this realm is so that he might die, now it's about to happen. And he did not want to go through with it. Some would say, oh, but he was the he was he was the son of Elohim. Yes, it doesn't minimize him being the son of Elohim. He's still the son of Elohim. It doesn't change anything. But I think sometimes we we like to make Messiah seem as though he was somehow disconnected with the human experience. As though he did not feel those things that we human beings feel when we're about to go through something very, very traumatic that's about to hit our lives. He experienced all of that. And he showed that. That doesn't mean that he had sinned. It doesn't mean that he minimized his divinity at all. I mean, after all, does not the scriptures teach us that we are all made in the image and likeness of Elohim? It's a thought. See, we who are human beings, we sometimes minimize all of the emotions that are in the Most High. And Yahshua experienced that on the physical level as well as having that in himself because he made us. He made us. And so it's important that we're able to see that he went through all of this. That Moshiach that was upon him was being pressed out. How are you going to have a king now being one cursed upon a tree? Those two things don't work out together. <laughs> now, see, I'm just sharing, I'm just sharing my, my perspective on it, all right? But when I see names of places, such as this particular place that Messiah went to, Right after Passover, he just revealed to his disciples that Passover, that Asakomen, that bread of affliction represented him, and that the third cup of wine, all right, cup of redemption, where he said, This cup is the Bri Harasha or the renewed covenant in my blood, which is given for the sins of many. He was showing the disciples. That all of this that you have been doing since you was way high, all of it pointed to me. And now he is about to prepare himself for the suffering. And so while they're there at Gethsemanim, Gethsemane, for those who have a difficult time with the Hebrew, <laughs> I know I have to switch on and off and on and off because some folks say, well, I don't get all that Hebrew stuff you're talking about. Overseer, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll use language that you're familiar with. Gethsemane. <laughs> <laughs> and while he was there at Gethsemane, he was going through this process and knew that he was about to be taken. This brings us up to the text that we read. Here comes Judas. Judas had left from Passover and went to go and meet with the chief priests to let them know, well, you know, it's time. If we're going to do this thing, we better do it now. Everybody's finished up the Passover. You know, because the the religious leaders of that time, they said, we don't want to do anything on the feast day. If we arrest them on the feast day, there might be a riot. So what they decided was, look, let the people have the Passover celebration. After they have the Passover celebration, then we're going to do what we need to do. And so they came after Passover was good and well finished. I'm talking about the, the actual Seder celebration of the first day. We know that, you know, you continue you know, with eating unleavened bread for the next uh, six more days. But as far as the main day of eating the lamb, the unleavened bread, bitter herbs together, that whole thing, that was done. So they came. Judas had already queued 
the officers and said, the one that I go to, that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one. That's what he said. That, that's the one. And so he goes over to Yeshua and he kisses him on the cheek. And Messiah already knew what the deal was. He knew he was already coming. Messiah knew he was coming before he got there. After he got up from praying the third time and he told the disciples and said to them, all right, you know, y'all are resting, but you're going to have to get up because the one who is about to betray me, he's here. So he knew what he was coming to do. But yet Messiah asked him, what are you here for? What's your business here for? And while Peter was watching what was going on and seeing the multitude, because the scripture says that there was a multitude there now. You know, there was a whole lot of folk that came. They must have thought that Yeshua was somebody really powerful. I mean, it was only three of them there. Three of them there and you need a multitude to arrest somebody? <laughs> I want you to think about this now. They, I mean, you know, they knew, I believe, in their heart of hearts that the Messiah, that Yeshua from Nazareth was powerful. But they hated him so. He didn't fit their mold as being the Messiah. They couldn't deal with the fact that he did not toe the line of their theological perspective. You know, we, we got a lot of situations like that in our time. You know, people have a problem. You can't toe the line of how we believe and how we think, and we don't want nothing to do with you. <laughs> Without realizing that all of us have to get to a place well, we realize that we are nothing but servants of the king. And that just because we might know a little bit doesn't necessarily mean that we know everything. Because there's some things that we may come into the knowledge of that we might have to go back and say, oh, I was wrong on that point. <laughs> I was wrong. on Look, I, I, I've, been, I've been serving the Almighty over, over 30 years ministering the word, helping establish congregations and do these things. You know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a long time, but in the process of time, what has happened is that as we come into an understanding of the truth of the ancient faith, we begin to rethink what we were taught. And we have to get to a place where we learn that I will be in agreement with what the Most High says and not my own personal opinions. And if I have to go back and say, well, you know, I'm sorry, but I was wrong on that one, <laughs> be humble enough to say it. Because we are called to be servants of the Most High. No more, no less. Servants of the Most High to do his bidding in the earth. Yahshua did not fit the pattern of the religious leaders of his time. But they knew there was something about him. They could never trap him in any type of dialogue they had. They could not get him to say something that might incriminate him. Nothing. They could never get him on anything. So they said, look, you know what? We're going to kill him. We're we going to get him. We're going to get him somehow. So look, just send a multitude out there. All right? <laughs> They sent the multitude out there, and it was just three of them, four of them, excuse me. I've been saying three, four of them, Messiah and Peter, James, and John. That's it, four of them. Imagine that. Peter sees what's going on, and immediately he gets on the defense. I know he's probably like this. He probably has a sword right here, and he's probably like this. You know how people, when they had a gun on them right here, and they packing everything, and they like, you know, they like ready to go. Peter was just like this. Who going to do something? Yeah. You ready? Who? Who? Who's coming now? And so when one of the servants of the high priest came, he just uh -huh. cut off his head. He was ready. They were strapped with their swords. That's what I called it. They were strapped. Yeah. <laughs> they were strapped. Because you had this. Now look, they had a multitude, it says, that had swords and clubs. And if you have a King James Version in your Bible and it says staves, 
All right, so I've got I've got this here. This right here is the Greek uh, interlinear with the King James translation. So I go in and out of the Greek so that I can make sure when I'm teaching, I want to bring you the accurate um, understanding of the text from the Greek, even though it's translated into the English King James. You know, King James didn't do the best translating. It did, did a pretty good job, but not the best. All right, so we got to go back and look at the, the, the original first and then present the information as best we can, as accurately as we can. But the term will be clubs. They came with swords and clubs. They said, look, we're going to be ready. So we don't know what's going to go down here. And so Messiah looks at all of this. He's like, wow. You know, y'all came out here, you know, like I was some crazy murderous criminal or something. You know, what, what's happening here? I mean, wasn't I in the temple teaching? Regularly, I mean, I was, last week I, I was there last week teaching in the temple. You say y'all remember me coming into the temple? Remember I was throwing and tearing up stuff, you know, with the money changes, and they had their doves and different. I was throwing stuff around because I said, "Look, y'all don't need to be selling this stuff at an escalated price when people come in to worship at the temple." Y'all have been telling folk that you know, hey, you know what? Your offering that you just brought with you, you may have traveled some 40 miles from north from northern Israel, but you know, we can't accept your offering. But we have some turtle doves, and we have a bullock, and we have a lamb over here. But you know, the price of it was like five, ten times more than what it would be valued at. I mean, they was performing highway robbery there in the temple. It was crazy. Yahshua said, I was there in the temple. Y'all remember why you didn't do anything then? When I was throwing up tables and chairs and stuff, and you know, you didn't do anything then when I was, and I was really causing a ruckus then. Y'all didn't get me then. So now, it's just only us few here, and you bring a multitude out? A multitude out? You know, I, I don't really have the number in my head of what a multitude would be. But anytime I hear the word multitude in the scriptures, you know, multitude refers to, um, I would have to say, may, maybe in the hundreds normally. Scriptures talk about thousands, you know, about the multitudes that was following him. Then he talked about that he fed 5,000 plus women and children, but they were the multitudes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't really get a solid roundabout number, but there might have been a few hundred of them that were there. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to help us to really see this. And it's just Messiah and his three disciples with him. And so what Messiah does, he says to them, you know, I see y'all came out here, swords and clubs, you know, you, you know, came prepared. But he said, but I don't think you realize that if I wanted to, I could Call on Haba right now. And he would send down 12 legions of angels right now. He wants them to understand that this thing that's about to take place, it's not happening because you have such power or you have force. He said, I'm laying my life down. I'm letting you do this. That's what he's saying. He said, he said the reality of it is, I'm letting you take me. Because you really don't have what it takes to arrest me and confine me and hold me unless I'm allowing you to do it. And this is what was going on. He was going through the process and he humbled himself. I mean, you, you got you to see what was going on in, in the mind of Messiah. Where he goes into the temple, tells them, my house shall be called the house of prayer. Then, after he has the Passover, he gets pressed all the way out. Where it's like, okay, I'm not that strong leader right now. See, the disciples were watching this that was going on. And, and even though the disciples were told they were told that, look, I'm going to die. A couple days before Passover came, he said, look, 
We getting ready for the Passover. When the Pesach comes, I'm going to be arrested by the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees. They're going to kill me, but in three days, I'm going to rise again. And I'm going to meet with you all in Galil, the Galil, Galilee. I'm going to meet with you all there. He tells them that. He gives them the whole layout so that they'll know what's going to take place. He didn't want anything to be a secret to them. But in their minds, they wasn't ready for that. So you know how it is when you grow up thinking one thing, believing one thing to be a certain way all your life. You're told, oh, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to deliver us out of our oppressions. We've come through the oppression of Babylon. And that was a major victory where the father brought us back to the land of Israel and we were able to rebuild the temple. But then we still had to deal with oppression by the Hellenists, the Greeks, and the Persians, then the Greeks, and, 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 and now the Romans are oppressing us. I mean, they come in through the streets. Sometimes they'll take one of us and they'll take us down the street, give us a beat down, you know. See, the Romans, they weren't all that nice during that time. <laughs> Why do you think Yeshua made the statement and he said, if someone hits you on the one cheek, give them the other? He wasn't saying that with reference to the fellow Israelites. <laughs> he was saying this with reference to the Roman brutality. Because he wanted to help them to understand why you're here and the Romans are occupying you, you're going to have to learn to be at peace. I know you zealous running around here saying the independence of the land of Israel. Look, we need to go back to the time of Maccabee, Judah Maccabee. We need to give them a beat down. We need to no, he said, no, look, y'all going to have to deal with the Romans right now. But while the Romans are here, you're going to have to deal with them in a peaceful manner. So when they come and knock you upside the head, give them your other. Now, you know, that's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? But it's better to keep your life than to lose it. <laughs> No, some probably would say, say, Overseer Mo, you're giving a different interpretation. No, I'm not. That was the reality of their situation during that time. So you had the Torah that gave you instruction on how to deal with situations when you had conflict with one brother and another. The Torah already spoke about how you're not to smite a fellow brother. They already knew what the Torah said about that. But when you're dealing with the Romans, a Roman was considered to be a goyim, a Gentile, an uncircumcised person, an unclean person. So it's kind of like they basically felt like if now, now if somebody who's not in the house of the family of Israel does something to us, look, it's no problem for us to retaliate and feel justified by it. That was the thinking of that time. And here it is, Messiah giving himself Freely. This is what he's doing. He's giving himself freely. He wanted them to understand that you are not taking me by force. I'm giving my life up. He said, I want you to understand that I have great power. Now, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew doesn't give the description of what happened when they asked him who he was. One of the other writers, when they asked Yahshua who he is, and he says that I am, the scripture says that they all fell back. Mm -hmm. They got a whiff of his power, but he was letting them know, look, I'm laying my life down. I'm going through this process of putting all this aside because I'm about to go through this time of torture and death. I'm about to take on sin. I'm about to become a curse. The disciples, they, they were still trying to get it, but after Yeshua said to Peter, look, Peter, we're not going to fight. I've told you already I'm going to die. See, he still hadn't gotten it. It's like about the fourth time. <laughs> Where, well, I mean, they, they had already been told about three times. Look, I don't know. Maybe Messiah told them more. The scriptures revealed to us. It was about three times that he told them, look, 
I'm going to die. They're going to arrest me. I'm going to die. And, and, and Messiah even said, look, Peter, you going to leave me? All of y'all going to leave me. He said, when they smite the shepherd, the sheep are going to scatter. All of y'all going to leave. And they said, no, no, we're not going to leave. We're going to stay at Peter. And Peter, you know, being all self-righteous, he said, no. He said, I'll die with you. I'm going down with you. You know, I mean, he was like, look, I'm going to, hey. You know, Messiah is listening to all of this. He said, you know, Peter, you know. Say, and I'm using I'm using my vernacular here. You know, it's like Peter. You know, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm. I appreciate the fact that you're saying all this. You know, you got good intentions, man. But look, the reality is, you're gonna deny me three times, and then the rooster is gonna crow, letting everybody know, signs up. <laughs> rooster is gonna crow, man. It's gonna be three times you're gonna deny me. When Messiah told Peter, put that sword back in its sheath. When he told him, put it back, Peter realized that it wasn't going to go down the way he thought it was. He realized that Messiah is giving himself up. Our king, our Messiah. I just see, you know, they, they were watching all of this. They saw when the whole multitude of them had fell back. But he just gave himself up. And they all left. So the scriptures revealed to us. It says they all left. I guess at that point they probably felt like, you know what? We better just go. Because if we stay here, this multitude is here. Look, he's not doing anything. See, in time past, any time that something came up. Messiah would handle it. When they were on the boat going across the sea, the winds and the waves were boisterous. And Messiah would sleep in the boat. I mean, sleep in the boat. And, and the scripture said, the storm was crazy. Winds and waves and everything going crazy. They said, look, get up. Aren't you concerned that we're going to die out here? So Messiah gets up, he says he speaks to the wind and the waves, tell everything to be still, calm down, and everything settles. But what happens next? Messiah says to them, oh, you of little faith. Every kind of situation that they endured that was challenging, Messiah would handle it. This particular time, he did nothing. And think about it. You know how we human beings are. You know, we, we feel pretty secure when it seems like everything is being handled. Everything's okay. You know, we go and we trust in the, in, in, in the master because of the fact that, hey, he's, he's handling it on every other occasion. Surely he's going to handle this situation. But this one, it's like, look, he's not doing anything. He's not trying to escape. He's not trying to get away. He's willfully giving himself up. So what are we going to do? They left. I said, no, we need to get out of here. Because if we stay here, they're going to take us too. We need to go. <laughs> so they left. They did not feel secure at that time. Not at all. And the reason why I say that is because during the whole time frame of the Messiah's ministry, his disciples had difficulty with faith. That difficulty with faith in who he was. Yeah, they believed him. Yeah, they saw the miracles. But you know what? It takes a while before someone gets to a place where they are sound in their faith. Most of us as human beings, we, we're really living at a level of understanding where it's all about what we see. And it's all about our experiences in life and circumstances that are challenging in life being taken care of. But what about when you're in a situation where your circumstances are not being taken care of? What if it looks like it's about to go down bad? What are you going to do? Is your faith in the most high enough to know that he is working everything out according to the counsel of his will? They didn't know that at that time. But Messiah had told them. He told them everything that was going to happen. He let them know. But I guess they didn't get it. 
When I look at this whole experience, it teaches us that Messiah knows everything. And he knows us as human beings. Sometimes we don't really know ourselves the way we think we do. We may think that we are more spiritual than what we really are. <laughs> we may think that we are stronger than what we really are. But when the Mosai tells us, this is what you really are, and this is how much strength you really have, and this is where you really are in your spiritual condition, boy, it can really be a wake-up call, can it? What I've discovered in my walk is that each day I go before the Father and I tell him I trust in your mercies for every day. I ask for your wisdom in the Holy Spirit for every day. Lest I fall, lest I slip for whatever reason, I'm trusting in your grace and your spirit to guide and direct my steps. My job is to deny my flesh. That's my job. That's every individual's responsibility is to deny yourself. You don't hear a lot about denying yourself. You don't hear too many people preaching about denying yourself, do you? There are a lot of preaching going on, but you really don't hear much about denying yourself. You hear a lot about asking forgiveness. I'm not, I'm not down in asking forgiveness, but Messiah, when he laid it out and he said, if anyone's going to come after me, he said what? Let him deny himself. Take up his crossbar and follow me. So you mean to tell me that the whole process of discipleship involves denial of oneself? Self-denial, yes. That's an unpopular subject. <laughs> but it's the truth. So oftentimes we miss that. We miss that. But in all that took place with the betrayal of Judas, with the, 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 the uh, dispersion of the disciples, they're leaving him. The denial of Peter, all of that that took place. I believe that when Messiah told the disciples all of these things that were going to take place, and then I'm going to rise again and I'm going to meet with you in Galilee. After all of that, he was showing the love and kindness of the Almighty to them. He's basically saying, I know that you're going to fail. I know that you are weak. I know you can't handle this that's about to take place. I already understand it. So I'm telling you what's going to happen because I already know but it's going to be okay. So oftentimes when we deal with stuff in our life, and I don't know what each one of you might go through, each one of us, even though my wife and I are married, you know, there's, there's things that she may deal with and go through separately from what I may deal with and go through. But whatever circumstances that we all may be going through or have gone through or maybe in the process of going through, we might not want anybody to know what's going on in our heart and in our mind, but the Father knows. And even if we might fail in the process, how many of you ever fail in the process when you're going through something? It's like you feel like, okay, Father, I messed up on this one. I didn't trust you like I knew I should have trusted you. I know what your word said, but I, as a human, I thought maybe I should do it a different way. You know what he still says? It's going to be okay. Okay, I want you to trust me. I want you to follow me. I want you to depend upon me. I'm so glad that Psalm 103 says that he knows our frame, that we're just men. We can't use that for an excuse to sin. We can't use that for an excuse to be disobedient or to do anything contrary to the word of Torah. But he knows, and that's a comforting thing 
Because since he knows, it means that he will help us. Everything that Messiah was going through right here was for the sole purpose of bringing about redemption for the sins, the failures, the mess-ups, the everything that we have done. He was about to go through suffering and death. I trust that, as I wrap this up, I trust that we could learn from this to know that as Messiah is going through this process of getting ready to die, that he did all of this for our sake so we might be redeemed. Most of us in here, we have a knowledge of the scriptures. We understand that the Almighty desires that we live obediently to the scriptures. But challenges come. Challenges hit every last one of us in some way, form, or fashion. Sometimes the challenges might be with loss of employment, loss of a family member, breakdown in the marriage, loss of a child. There are so many things that come in people's lives that challenge them where they begin to feel like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've only named a few. There's so many things that come that put, ple that put people in what we call between a rock and a hard place. And they don't know which way to turn. But Messiah has the answer, and Messiah is already working it out according to his sovereign will for our lives. Now that may be something very difficult for people to accept and to embrace, but he is. I've experienced it in my own life many years ago. He is, and he loves each and every one of us. And his redemption, as the scripture says, is plentiful or plenteous. He redeems us fully and delivers us fully. For there's always a hope. Be encouraged. Will you stand at this time?